Cool, so I think we can start. So, ahoy and hello, everybody. My name is Lenka Vrablíková, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth conversation of Mycorrhizal Encounter series. The series is part of a festival called Descendants of Fungi and Ecopolitics of Sharing, organized by LESS, which translates as Woods, a community for cultivation, theory, and art based in Czech Republic. Mycorrhizal Encounter series is organized by myself, by Elspa Mitchell, and Teresa Porybna. Uh, and it has all been possible also thanks to Ida Tausch, who has been working on this project with us from the very beginning and who is always behind the scenes. In previous conversations, we talked with various practitioners who work with fungi. Last week, Elspeth and I spoke with Zimbabwean mushroom farmer, entrepreneur, and educator and campaigner Chido Govera. Before that, our guest was Shali Zuniga, who is an artist, scholar, educator, and activist based in Mexico. And Teresa, the first conversation was facilitated by Teresa, and that was a conversation with the founder of Radical Mycology, Peter McCoy, from the US, with Jonas Gruska, who is a sound artist and organizer of Festival Mikolom, which is a fungi festival which takes place in Bratislava every year. And I just want to remind you that all conversations were recorded, and you can find them on the YouTube channel of the Institute of Anxiety. On this channel, you will also find a recording of the conversation we are having today. And the session today is going to be about an hour long, and I would like to invite those who have joined us on Zoom to post their questions in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screens. And we will get to your questions in the second half of our conversation. So thank you all for joining us today, and I will hand over to Elspeth, who is going to introduce our guest today. Thank you. Thanks, Anka. So it's a real pleasure to introduce Tai Shani. Tai is an artist based in the UK and her work expands across performance, film, photography and installation, often revolving around experimental narrative texts. And you may have encountered her previous project DC Productions from 2014 to 2019, an epic and episodic work of performance, installation and film, which proposed an allegorical city of women, an experimental and expanded adaption of Italian poet and author Christine de Pizan's feminist book, The Book of the City of Ladies from 1405. The collected texts of DC Productions were published in 2019 as Our Fatal Magic, and I have my copy here. Um, and Lenka and I saw this work together actually um, at the Semiramis exhibition at the Tetley Gallery in Leeds, UK. And we were really so excited and enthralled by the work. So we were again really excited and interested to discover a new body of work, the Neon Hieroglyph. Um, featuring online as part of the Manchester International Festival series earlier this year and described as a hallucination around ergot, the work is a rich body of research taking the fungus ergot as its starting point and some of the project has until last week actually also been on show at Futura in Prague and Ty was invited to Brno as part of the Halopetsky award as well. So we're so pleased to have you here in conversation with us today, Ty. And maybe we can start by um, telling us the story of the Neon Hieroglyph as a research and artistic project. So where it began and what it explores. Okay, um, so I think there are a few kind of um, different agents at play. So one, one is like coming to the end of a very big body of work and wanting, so there was a kind of intermediary body of work, uh, not body, like project that, for me was a step away from the DC productions because like methodologically you could potentially continue a city you know a city can be infinite in a way and you can kind of rethink it adapt it to your current interests you know it could have gone on forever but I think I, I reached a kind of certain point with my politics that I felt needed uh, a shift and one of the, the reasons that I kind of wanted to move away was to do with the, my, my subject position, which was, I didn't feel was, like I felt that as someone who kind of um, is also in academia, I teach, I felt that a lot of the kind of scholarship that we were um, engaged with and teaching and, and, and reading, you know, was often uh, written, like forged in, in danger by people that live very precarious lives. 
uh, people that are often kind of in situations um, of, of very like intense discrimination, lifelong discrimination. And I felt that, you know, there was something a bit like a problem of us using all this kind of scholarship and all of these ideas, um, you know, including potentially like some strategies around speculative fiction and be a declarative voice, you know. So when I started the project, it was a kind of, for me, um, an encounter with feminism. And then I, I became educated. And then by the end of it, I didn't feel like I wanted to be this like, come with me, I am the voice of, you know, I want to be the voice of feminism. I wanted to kind of take a, a different position. So one of the things that um, I was interested in pursuing, and it isn't like, I don't think this falls upon strict identity or identitarian lines of like, oh, I grew up in a hippie commune, therefore LSD kind of culture is my culture. But I did feel like I was interested in the way that the kind of psychedelic imagination was something that not only I grew up in and kind of the politics of that, but that I was also, it's something that somehow had always been present in my work, you know, had been this kind of um, dimension to, to my work and writing throughout. And I wanted to expand on that in a deeper way. Um, so, and I also was interested in, I'm sorry if I, I've got a bit of a cough, so you'll have to forgive me. <coughs> sorry. Um, I was interested in also like using some of the strategies that I had um, built in DC Productions, which is like, I guess, looking at history, any history as a horizontal uh, rhizomatic space that ideology kind of create carves out narratives within. So I thought like, you know, ultimately history is everybody's experience that ever was and, and certain voices become uh, audible and visible through like ideological frameworks. So I was interested in seeing how I could maybe trace a history around psychedelics. And I thought this ergot was like a really interesting kind of uh, agent for me. And there's a few reasons why. Uh, one is that it, it, like potentially Europe, let's say, could have been, um, you know, a, like the history of ergot could have been kind of embedded within like Western history in a much more explicit way than it is. And secondly, I was interested that it kind of touched on these kind of uh, feminized nodes historically, like as an abortive substance, Persephone's descent, you know, like the Eudicinian mysteries, um, even maybe I should just say what ergot is for people who don't know. Actually. Yeah, maybe, Sorry. yeah. Yeah, um, so ergot is, a, is um, a fungus that grows on like very common grains like rye and barley. And until um, there was like industrial milling, it was very common for there to be outbreaks or poisonings. So people would get very sick and there was the order of St. Anthony, which was a kind of uh, order um, of people that took care of people that had ergotism. So it was kind of something that you could almost say was very prevalent, but it was, it's also the, the fungus that LSD is derived from, weirdly, so, or synthesized from, let's say. So in a way, there's this kind of like strange um, role that it could have been like, you know, a lot of kind of indigenous cosmologies emerged from having some kind of psychoactive agent involved. So it could, you know, like there's this possibility that we could have had uh, this kind of psychedelic history had things have been different. And then also I was interested after my previous project, finding a way, um, you know, to kind of, mm, to create a bridge, let's say, or some form of uh, conceptual passageway between the strategies of the speculative and the demands of like the social materialist, let's say. And to me, ergot was an interesting kind of um, vector for that because any hallucinogenic, any mushroom, hallucinogenic mushroom, or yeah, masculine, whatever it is, um, is simultaneously material and immaterial, but there is, it's not about belief. It's not a belief system. People who ingest, um, you know, like 
uh, got contaminated bread did have halluc hallucinations. It wasn't about, I believe, therefore I saw, you know, it's something yeah. that happens like completely um, outside of the, the um, uh, conditions of, of faith, you know, so, so to me that was, that's like an interesting thing. And similarly, the witch is also a character <coughs> that straddles, you know, the material and the immaterial world because, you know, she's human, but she's very close to the wicked supernatural, let's say, and, she, and in turn she's a wrecker of civilization. So these two characters were, or not really characters, but let's say protagonists, were interesting for me to find ways to, to create more, like a more dialogical framework between, you know, this kind of fantastical world building and um, the reality of like um, a systemically white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchal world, basically, that I don't, you know, like I think, the, I still really believe in the kind of political expediency and 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 uh, possibilities that speculative fiction offers, but I also feel that you know that sometimes it can be just about what if, or sometimes there's something about like you know I think it kind of doesn't take into account um, the layers. Of, of different kind of experience with these types of knowledge that we exist within. You know, so like in the art world and in academia, people are very like gender is over, but like outside, you know, it, there's often, you know, you, you, you have situations where it's very much not the case. <coughs> even just culturally, it doesn't have to be even um, about bad will. You know, it can be like just people that, yeah, have very different mm. experiences of that. And then the last thing about how I came into that project was a very weird and silly Google search, which was, um, I, I think I remembered someone talking to me once about this all women commune, hippie commune outside of Rome. And I think I just literally did like psychedelia, hippies, LSD, Italy, or something like that. Because I had to propose something that was Italian related. <laughs> And then this island came up called Ali Kudi, and it came up and it was like, which is actually, um, we're going to share um, one of the episodes of the Neon Hieroglyph and that, that um, episode, Ali Kudi. <coughs> so it was, it's this very odd island where people claim that because of its remoteness and poverty, people ate contaminated rye for 450 years. And that was like the beginning of this Neon Hieroglyph project. Yeah, well, that sounds like a very great beginning. Thank you for that. <laughs> I, and maybe maybe we can watch that video now that uh, which you just mentioned. And and I already have like ten questions I want to ask, but maybe it would be good for for yeah, all of us to, to yeah. watch that one. So Ida, if I yeah. can ask you to to play that for us, that work I shared with us so generously.
Alakudi. Aeolian Islands, 1862. This bread is a placebo. The bread is a spaceship. Gothic seasides. Breached nebula. Fabric rustle. Birdsong. Bark. Air. And breath echoes into a psychogenic fractal decomposition. Our fractal love. Our fractal dread. We see you. We make and are made by you. We will still be here in the disintegration of us, which leaves an unfolding of luminous, ibis feathered, haloed trails around our movements. We say tetragrammatic words of the mystics and triptych images of the patronized artists, trinities holy and unholy from the borderlands of Hell House with its garden envenomed by the overgrown oleander bushes. You, me, and us. We will all find decay in the perished remains of their corrupt architecture, in the electronic rush of a constant We hear a constant horizon. We see in the constant horizon a mausoleum for the psychedelic witches. We paint our bodies with the oleander oil, like Persephone painted all the flowers of the world. We make circles of salt. We fly to the sleepy Calabrian towns to steal from the rich. We kiss with venomous serpents. We spell for revolution. We invoke the angels that course wildly in the elements. A hundred and fifty-nine years later, we summon the tiny animistic gods that imbue wood with its woodness. The tiny gods that render sulfur sulfuric. The tiny gods of wood transformed into tiny gods of paper. The tiny gods of glue, the tiny gods of sand melted to become tiny gods of glass that has been crushed and they now mingle with tiny red gods of phosphorus to make a surface for that match to strike and ignite. They call upon the many tiny furious gods of the fire and we will throw that match and watch the tiny gods furiously burn their whole life-taking infernal world down and we will see each other's smiles in the light of that fire. This bread is real. It kills heroes. This bread is a star maker of collected stardust. Okay, Th thanks Sarah for, for showing that and I ha hope we were all able to see that. And I, thank you. And, and I wanted to ask you, uh, just watching now that, that film again, um, when you were saying that you, you don't, you realize that you don't want to be in that position of being like a voice of feminism and, and, you know, like being that, the person who tells like your soul from your identity. Is that, is that, that you include, or it, there is air God, and there's all this poriousness and things are connecting and mingling. Is that kind of like a, 
way for you of dealing with that power or control and and being more kind of open to kind of kind of like a vulnerability or openness of voices which come and create that history or or is that something you've thought about in in, in um, connection to that no i don't think i meant it in that way i think i meant more that like the kind of feminist movement was being really co-opted by like a kind of you know girl boss uh capitalist you know cannibalization of some of these radical ideas and I didn't feel like I wanted to be part of that for sure. And I felt that maybe, you know, some of the kind of terminologies like city of women, you know, like could be also absorbed into that. And particularly, you know, in the UK at the moment, we've got like a real problem here with anti-transness, you know, and like I, I didn't want to be part of any of that kind of discourse. And also I felt like the kind of, you know, revolutionary voice is not a white voice. You know, I just felt that very strongly. It's not a white middle-class voice. And, you know, I think that there've been like a lot of conversations that are quite uncomfortable sometimes for, you know, um, maybe white women like myself where people question, you know, how radical, and of course it is complicated. And we also, you know, as white people, sometimes in the other, uh, situations like class and money and you know and all these kind of things but ultimately I felt that you know so much of the scholarship that's informing this morning moment um, is coming from other voices and I felt like I, I didn't want to I wanted to be very careful about you know where I position myself in that sense so I think it was more about that for me like feeling like I don't uh, identify with a lot of the things that were happening in that movement and I just wanted to kind of um switch position a little bit in terms of like the more declarative aspect but I agree that like you know Ergot has this kind of uh mitochondrial like kind of way history as well and 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 that's something that's always interested me and something that I've kind of try to um, create in my writing and it's definitely something that's just there in in that material and it, you know it's also like one of these things that has you could you could look at it as a you know like a medical uh, history of ergot or a kind of ritualistic history so I think it's quite interesting these kind of things that are there but don't, not, don't have claims staked around them very clearly so I thought that was like something I wanted to do but, um, you know, the, the footage that you, in the beginning of that, that's um, like original footage from like the 50s when um, ergot was used to treat migraines, actually. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so that's really interesting. Um, what about, so I'm just thinking about the visuals there and, and how, because when you talk about psychedelics and, and the psychedelic state, there's a lot of um, tropes or how the how, ways that this is visualized. And it's, could you maybe talk about how you um, address that or didn't, or how did you approach that, those issues in your work when you were working with this, with these kinds of themes? And yeah. I'll I mean, there. I think things have got, have got better in terms of uh, uh, representations of psychedelic vernaculars. Hmm. But I also, one of the things that I talk about in the project is like, um, entoptic phenomena which are, are like these kind of um, auto-generated uh, imagery like you know like floaters or spots or like uh, squiggly lines and there are people that um, there's like a school of thought that kind of claims that very early cave paintings and cave uh, markings were actually representations you know before um, there was like the possibility of bringing fire necessarily into a cave that there was like these markings on caves that were representations of, of darkness in a way and that that was something quite poetic to me like you know that the first artist might have been trying to document um something that wasn't there for anyone else i thought that was quite a nice kind of um poetic image um to think about but then also i you know the the kind of uh, language of psychedelics is that is the blueprint of it in a way are these kind of 
uh, phenomena, these, these internal phenomena. And I was looking at like these shared languages that also people that let's say go into trances have, or people that like, you know, um, experience certain forms of psychosis also speak of having this visual language. So like I was interested or even, even, um, you know, like Google deep dream when they, it's like a kind of pattern seeking uh, software that looks for a pattern in an image and then reproduces it and looks for the pattern again. <coughs> and often like you end up with this very, very um, psychedelic eyes, you know, animal noses, this, this kind of uh, hybrid, like hybrid, but also re repetitive with like these colors. And when I first saw those images, I remember a few years ago, someone, you know, post, like everyone did a, a, a portrait of themselves, you know, like you, you could uh, submit um, your picture into that, um, onto the server and it would do it to any picture. And like the first time I saw it, I was like, wow, I've never seen that vernacular, that language uh, represented so exactly. And it was interesting to me that it was AI that produced that, you know? So there's something also like, there's this um, type of running mythology in my work about AI and like um, the divine and uh, the psychedelic that kind of touch. And so in one of the lines in the pieces, you know, when, when AI dream, they dream in uninhibited psychedelics, which is, I guess, a take on like the Blade Runner kind of, um, quote but like yeah so I think to me there was definitely something about like this language that was of interest to me in, in itself regardless of its um simulation like more like why 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 do all trips have that why do people experience the same kind of language why do um yeah like how, how come there's this commonality so that was one of the things that I was like interested in in thinking about and looking at through the picture and then with my own kind of <coughs> uh, language in it. So I work very closely with Adam Sinclair who does all the VR, um, VFX stuff, all the animations. And obviously like animation also has this unboundedness. You know, you, you can have a, a character that's like um, drowning for seven minutes and then gets up. You know, you can have this kind of, mm. um, these bodies that are emancipated from the limitations you know of, of the conditions of our existence so in itself i think that potentially there is like the psychedelic dimension to uh you know to animation like computer generated animation and also it's getting into the zone where you know there are moments where it's quite realistic but it's still not you know and i think that there's something about it right now that is interesting to me and was interesting for this but it was also a lockdown project um, so the writing, I think, always had that kind of tone to it. But there's there are a few kind of breathing moments in the film, like there's a starscape that's breathing and also <coughs> a, a window outside. There's like a kind of uh, leaf ripple. So that, yeah, that, but it's also like what you can do with uh, animation. You know, so it's, it, it's kind of this dual purpose of, one trying to create a language for it, but also trying to exploit the possibilities of, um, of you know, like an unbound reality that takes a lot of server farm rendering. But apart from that, it's very freeing. Yeah, yeah, that, that's very um, interesting how, how you could couple these two things together. And, and I was thinking about your film, and this one we just saw the, um, that it's not a, so psychedelics are really popular now, right? Like uh, it's like microdosing thing. And yeah. I don't know whether you heard about um, when if Paltrow first group lap. Oh, really? Yeah. The, yeah. the healing trip, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and it's just like really like in a, it becomes this technology in, you know, uh, for for creating profit and neoliberalism and and it sparkled with this kind of like pseudo what I would call pseudo feminism, right? And then finding your inner goddess and then you yeah. know like all, all these things and 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 there it's connecting a lot to things like care and healing, you know, this like a feminine like a um, old-fashioned or idealized feminine tropes, you know, and um, and and I, 
what, what I really like about how how you make that intervention into it, all these like new kind of like imaginaries and usages of psychedelics in, in contemporary culture. And I just find it really interesting. And I was wondering whether you could tell us more about how you think about what kind of, um, how do you relate to that? What's happening in culture now and psychedelics and, and what kind of trip or for whom? Or yeah. how do you critique that, the, you know, the story of the trip, you know? Yeah, it's really it's difficult. Hard. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, like, it's really difficult on one hand, because like, yeah, I, it's something, I, I took my first trip when I was very young, I was like 12. And, you know, it's something that I grew up around, like very much around me. And it is weird to see like a corporate voice kind of vent, uh, ventriloquizing some of this stuff. But ultimately, like, I don't, you know, like, I, I think that um, capitalism is rotten to its very core and is, is, a, is a, you know, I don't see any kind of redemption for it, let's say. I don't see a, a kind of redemptive narrative that could emerge for it now. <coughs> but I do see, like, maybe, you know, you have to have hope as well, even in these very, very, very dark times and particularly... I think having seen like these socialist movements emerging in the UK and in America and see them completely obliterated has been very demoralizing and has made, you know, all these kind of things that maybe had that not have happened, I would have had like more positive kind of feelings about it. But ultimately I, I do think that there is something about these experiences that, I mean, maybe I haven't unlocked another level of hell beneath us that like within which everything is um, co-optable or everything can be metabolized by, by it. But I do think the core aspects to a psychedelic experience that can't be um, commodified, you know, even if, if the kind of means of production of that um experience can be i don't think i think there's something there you know it's like lo love basically can't be when i say love i mean it in the most broad sense you know it can't be um contaminated by things like it's 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 like eternal in a way <coughs> so I, I see it more in those terms that like there's you know that piece that was very popular and for very good reason that jackie wang's oceanic feeling and communist affect and like to me you know there are things about the kind of psychedelic experience that offer that that offer a kind of transcendental uh, spiritual sense of what communism could be and the kind of affordances that it could offer so it's interesting tool in that way but again you know like whilst I had this very solidified position in the DC productions which was like here is, uh, you know, the answer, like it's a post-patriarchal city where we, you know, are oozing kind of fleshy, <coughs> gory creatures. I, I, I don't feel that I have answers anymore at all. I don't, I don't think I did then either, by the way. But I think like, I definitely feel that with this project, it's much more about exploratory, um, you know, like, setting a ground for exploration. Mm -hmm. That's really I'm sorry, I'm going to mute for one second whilst I cough. Yeah, so go ahead. Thanks, Ty. Um, Mao has put in the chat um, a link that I think we should look at uh, at some point um, after this. There is a, uh, Mao says there's a beautiful Welcome Trust documentary on Ergot and its uses from the 50s and a link. So I'll definitely That's be checking one. that That's out. That's the Is that one, the one? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, and I'm... One. I'm just going to read out a question we've got um, from one of the um, people on Zoom from Jali. You mentioned the importance of materiality within a sort of dialectical doubling of the object, especially with regard to the genesis of cosmology is fascinating. Do you consider that your work addresses a critical real dimension in the non-colonial aesthetic experience that your work elicits? And do you consider there to be an ontology of the psychedelic experience within the critical realist perspective. Would that even be possible, even with virtuality in general? 
Um, so I'm that's it. It's, to in, read this. it's in, in the, the Q and A. Okay, great. Thank <laughs> you. I'm like, I think I might need to go over this again. Um, so, is it possible to have an ontology of psychedelic experience? That's that's the that's outside that, of yeah. That's outside. I mean, yeah. I think that that's that's the difficulty, and that's hmm. I don't know if I'm answering this right, Shelley. I'm not completely. I don't feel completely um, confident to answer all the kind of aspects of that question, but I'll, I'll do what I can. Um, but I think that that's one of the problems with like um, psychedelic politics in general is how um, what happens to that ontology when, when it when it, it hits a non activated, let's say, space. Like how how does it persist, or what can be taken from from that? And again, like you know, what does it mean that let's say one is advocating for mass and I think these are really relevant questions mm. do I think that everyone should take uh have a mushroom trip no you know I, I I don't I think it's if someone wants to they should you know and should be able to safely and <coughs> in, a, in an environment where they feel safe but I don't feel like everyone should do that I mean coincidentally my parents had to flee the UK because they were involved in a, a plot to contaminate the water with LSD here in the 70s. So there was, you know, those ideas that like, it, you know, they're very countercultural ideas. Like if everyone had a trip, everything would be resolved. But the truth is, it's, it's very not like that. And like, ultimately, you know, there are all these like corporate um, retreats where people go and like have ayahuasca or whatever you know and they kind of have some sense of transformation the thing is I don't I don't have this I think it's quite a masculine mode as well to be like this is an answer or this is how you can do it I think they're useful things that can happen within psychedelic experiences that can be translated or taken forward you know like a kind of what I said earlier, like a kind of spiritual, transcendental sense of what what a, a non hierarchical, anarcho communism could be, is something that's worth kind of uh, conserving within like um, consensual non activated realities as well. <clears throat> but at the same time, I don't think like the answer means that everyone should just take a trip, and that would resolve everything. I mean, people did actually believe that. I don't think it's like that. I think, you know, that you have these experiences and then you come back into the kind of conditions of your life and you're, you're you know, you're re um, confronted with, with the kind of inconsistencies of capitalism, with the uh, ethical like kind of hole that we kind of exist in. There's nothing that can really change that. But I think that in a way, I mean, I, this sounds also a little bit, I know I've said this a lot in, in various contexts, but it's something I really belief and I think that this kind of the heroic narrative of this is what needs to happen is a patriarchal kind of narrative basically and that ultimately we are building like this house that we will never see never live in um, you know even like two or three generations down probably won't either but there is this kind of sense that like we are born into a kind of paradise and that the making of the world is like the making of hell and the unmaking of that is the making of paradise again so i think that this idea of like this is what we can do <coughs> this is how how it changes stuff doesn't work but i think that kind of creating like building blocks or kind of nodes that can communicate with like knowledges that we don't have yet let's say as well and i think that ultimately there is a sense of what I do really like about the psychedelic experience that I think is worthwhile thinking about is that you do have experiences of like trans uh, temporal, trans geographic solidarity on a visceral level. And, and that is something that I think is really useful, like in terms of thinking of how to navigate. But, you know, we, we each each of us are these kind of flashes of existence between like two eternal nothings or darknesses uh, with very limited energetic resources, limited um, 
you know, with needs, like we need to, to uh, live, we need to kind of exist and pay our bills and do all these things. And I think that the kind of demand of like solution is, is heroic, you know? I don't know if it's possible to ever have that, but I do believe in the event. I do believe in the revolutionary event, which is like many of these things coming together at once and there being um, a kind of, I guess, moment of catalyzation that happens that can be through a person or an event and that that can like have these accelerated moments of change, let's say. But I think that ultimately, is it bad for corporate culture to <coughs> subsume transformative experiences? If they're truly mm -hmm. transformative, it doesn't matter. Do you see what I mean? I mean, obviously I would rather that not, but I'm designing a label for a, um, a mushroom extraction enterprise. <laughs> Um, and I really like that sentence, um, this bread kills heroes, that, that was really, I think, yeah, that meant a lot <laughs> to me. <laughs> and and it, maybe just to carry on on what, what you were just saying, um, I don't know whether I can call your work trip that you were taking us, you know, it's a, it's a vision, right? There's also like yeah. a certain kind of vision. Um, it's not a good trip, it's not a bad trip, you know, it's very ambiguous, actually, what, what you know it's not an advertisement for you know people to start taking psychedelics and yeah and i really value that uh, kind of like ambiguousness and and that you're not resolving the situation you know and leaving it up to the the, the person watching your work also um and 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 i think what what's also very interesting in how you work with that um with witches and the history of witches you know because that that there are in, in, in certain feminist traditions, there is a celebration of that kind of like a mythical figure of witch, but then we know actually that it was a very devastating moment for women in Europe and what happened, right? And and, and how you were able to, yeah, um, cr critically and, and work through that history and through that myth. And I, if you could say more about the connection between yeah. witches and Ergot, that would be... Yeah, so, so the main connection was like, I, you know, like witches are... It, it's you know zeitgeist is like this is like this terrible lover in a way because it's it's really amazing to have these cultural moments where many people are thinking about the same thing and it is like wonderful you know because it creates events like this you know where you can have discussions but it also like makes you feel like sometimes am i suspect you know for for um kind of um locking into these things that everyone is in, you know, like the witches kind of thing. But I think there's two reasons why the witch I was interested in. And the first one's actually connected to Ali Kudi, the film we just saw, which is like a little bit about that. But they have like out of this, I don't know who the authority, but that's also interesting to me is that some person took it upon themselves there <coughs> to say that they had a, um, a trip you know, that people were tripping for 450 years. The reality is that the kind of climactic um, conditions, cl climatic conditions for um, ergot are quite specific. Like you need certain types of um, wet winters and, and warm early, you know, like it, it doesn't happen every year. You see what I mean? So like the, the reality of there being for, it's not, you know, being 450 years of ergot contamination is zero to none. Like it, it would be like a real kind of uh, miracle, let's say. And it's the same with um, the, mis you know, the Ulyssinian mysteries, like because they drank this drink called kaikion that has barley in it. Some people were like, yes, it had ergot barley. So they were, it was basically like a psychedelic drink and that's what the trip was, you know, but like, I find that quite interesting in itself, this kind of thing where, because all history is like that. You know, all history is someone taking it upon themselves to create the official narrative of an event, you know, so why, why not have these other kind of histories, you know, take, take center stage in a way. So that in itself is interesting. But like, so let's say for the, um, <coughs> for, for the sake of argument that there was a 450 year contamination and that everyone was tripping all the time there, 
then you have um, this mythology that emerges just in those islands, which are tiny islands that until like 20 years ago didn't have electricity on them. And they have this character called the Mayara that emerges and it's, it's a flying witch. And she is a socialist. Like she goes and steals from the rich. She brings food during a uh, famine. She brings like uh, luxurious goods from the mainland, from Calabria and brings it to, to the islands and creates these banquets on the beach where everybody's invited, everyone participates and enjoys the um, fruits of her, of her thieving. <coughs> and they paint their bodies in ointments and they fly, you know, and it's interesting that they, like, it's the only uh, affirmative witch that, that I know of in, in Europe like in terms of a specific mythology. So it started from that. Like I didn't, I wasn't like, oh yeah, I want to go witches on this, but then she was there and I couldn't really ignore her. Cause like, she's the kind of witch that, you know, I, I kind of like as well, but then the, the witch stuff, you know, from like, I know that um, Sylvia Federici has, has fallen out of favor, but I still think Caliban and the witch is a great book. And you know, her kind of deconstruction. What I mean, she is a good example and I hate to kind of <coughs> give her like airtime when she's being quite violent at the moment towards like trans people, but like she did that thing where, where she takes a character that lives within the realm of, of fantasy and world making and she does like a Marxist analysis on who those women were. And they're like divorcees, widows, <coughs> people that had no kind of access to um, sustenance and wealth that were often had to steal. And they become like um, witches, you know, they become persecuted socially. And it means that like also women in those positions don't you know are reluctant to beg because they know that there's a potential that they might be perceived in that way so you know it's an interesting kind of I'm really sorry I have to cough again I've been testing for COVID like every day and I don't have it are you doing Ty really, okay but really bad like oh. itchy cough um but yeah so like there's this kind of analysis of what witches were and I think that that kind of refrain is interesting you know because it's like she's not looking at just beliefs but she's looking at the social conditions that kind of create that so that's something that you know I want to kind of explore further is like taking these things that exist within like esoteria or like um that exist within structures of belief let's say but then to look at them in a more analytical and kind of a uh, social realist way. So from that, does your work, or have you thought much about the question of future in relation to that, in relation to these histories that you're looking at and the, the kind of the, the speculative fictions that you mentioned at the start um, and you're interested, there is a kind of interest in political, social and cultural transformation and, and and the visions of that in a way, but does that relate to, to you, to the question of future or how do you imagine future? At the moment I don't, and that's a really like horrible and sad answer, but that's kind of the truth of where things are for me at the moment. And, you know, like I kind of, at the beginning of the pandemic, despite the kind of trauma of the last elections here in the UK, um, I did have the, you know, there was this sense, like there was all this, all people talked about was like, oh, you know, we, it's a chance to rebuild ourselves, to rethink how we are socially, what we do. And, you know, two years later, it's worse. Like it, it's just been instrumentalized in the most kind of horrible of ways. Fascism is on the rise. Fascism is being normalized. You know, I don't, I don't at the moment see but again, that's why I hold hope in the event. You see what I mean? I hope that there's something on the horizon that I can't see now that will change um, things, you know, dramatically. And 
as much as I didn't want it to be an old white man like Jeremy Corbyn, that was an event. There was somebody suddenly there that was willing to kind of go with a very um, non-normative form of politics. You know, we're back in the normative now of like, nothing, you know, just career politicians, nothing meaning anything. Um, the continued kind of um, decimation of welfare, of like um, the aggregating of resources in more and more aggressive ways into sm smaller and smaller circles. You know, it's like corporate kind of um, money dictates policy. It's a really dark time. And climate, and everything's pretty awful, but I do hold hope that something can happen that we don't see and that we have to be prepared for it when it happens, you know? But like it was, yeah, it was interesting to go through, you know, I can't, like one thing I think about a lot is where I grew up in India and in Goa, there were lots of people there that were like <coughs> countercultural, how can I say this? You know, people that like were just dis disenchanted, you know, like people that were extremely political. There were people there from the Bader Meinhof group. There were people there that, you know, were very close to like um, the weathermen, like to all these kind of revolutionary groups. There were also people there that were just very close to, you know, like acid kind of being this messianic um, substance that was going to change the world. And a lot of them came there and became like total nihilistic hedonists. You know, like I grew up in the most apolitical like twilight of the counterculture. And I think they much like, I feel maybe a generation of us on the left and I'm assuming everyone here is on the left, which might not be true, um, have, are feeling now, which is that there was a moment that kind of got complete, everything was thrown at it everything was kind of done to make it fail, you know, to, to not allow it to be. And I think it takes time to recuperate from something like that, you know, because you could see, you could see the full force of the state and you could see the full force of like hegemony, you know, putting a barrier against uh, radical change, basic or radical transformation. So, you know, like, like taking acid, all these things are great, but like ultimately there's also a battle here. And that battle is, is against like a giant, you know? Mm. <coughs> so I think it's about like, yeah, I, 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 at the moment I don't have a hugely, you know, I always thought that the, the future would resolve in a kind of uh, paradisiac way. But at the moment I don't see that horizon at all. Mm. It's based on faith at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we we share, or at least I, and I think Elspeth share this as well. And 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 you know what I think is very for me about your work. What is so important about your the Neon Hieroglyph is that uh, you bring psychedelics into politics. You know, it is a very much like that is very explicit in that in that work and an art to politics you know and i think that's very very significant because it can really easily just you know this hedonistic nihilistic or yeah. political uh, feeling so so i think that that you're holding it there and you you literally hold on that it's really significant and and um maybe that can lead me to a question we have from a uh, audience neil or nile is asking um how much have bad trips mm -hmm influence your work and how or have you preferred to focus on more positive aspects of such trips um well i've definitely focused on more positive but i don't really believe in negative and positive although i think that definitely within psychedelic experiences you can have moments that you feel overwhelmed like that to me is a bad trip it's like feeling i can't deal with what's happening to me physically or i'm scared or i think i'm gonna have a heart attack or you know, like it's something like that. I, I don't get like very bad trips in the sense of um, like persecutory or these kind of things. I haven't had that many of those. I've had, you know, predominantly just moments that I felt scared and then I managed to 
get a grip kind of and then it was okay um and also I took a lot I took a lot more like now I, I'm very tame I, I mainly microdose and I've you know tried bigger doses a little bit but like when I was young I, I took the bulk of my experiences and I think that also you know I, I reveled in in the drama of a bad trip then which I don't think I would now at all you know because I it was a different time like this kind of new ageness was very uh, pushed away you know that it wasn't seen as something like no one you know like no one was like oh we're gonna like expand our minds it was just like we're gonna go into like some dark techno hole and be trippy in it but so I think it served a different function maybe socially a little bit but also it was a, you know it was a much different time in many ways and I think even then like my first encounters with drugs were like in Belgium listening to techno in the like very early 90s and going to raves and stuff and I definitely felt like when people said oh like do you take drugs because your parents took drugs I was like no I take drugs in the way that like any teenager would encounter you know it wasn't like in a positivist uh spiritual way it was like in, in a club in, in you know like the provinces in the middle of nowhere <laughs> do you know what I mean it wasn't like these kind of, I mean rave had a lot of positive kind of uh, messaging to it but like in general, I don't feel that the, that thing, that emphasis between posit positive and negative is is a social construct, I think. And that, you know, like um, we need to like find ways to be with, be with like sadness and be with unhappiness and be with fear in a, in a more kind of cohesive way, apart from just like trying to neutralize it. So, you know, I think you, you learn a lot from those things. Like I think, like times of my absolute heartbreak, which I, I suffered so much genuinely, but they were also like times that were very kind of generative in terms of my work, like what, you know, they fed into my work, they gave texture to my work. So I think it, it you know, like that positive negative thing, I don't really feel that much. I, I, I've said this many times before, but my favorite um, essay, ever one of them is by Amy Hollywood and it's called the unspeakability of trauma the unspeakability of joy and you know there, there are these kind of states on the edge of limit experience that defy language and those are things that I think are very generative in general you know so I don't know if like the kind of um you know I, I mean obviously like the ab abhorrent things exist you know uh abuse exists uh, prejudice all these things but I think which are unacceptable but I think being sad or being kind of having uh, a strong experience of loss or you know as long as these things are not like absolutely reconfiguring in a in a, in a breaking way you know that you can't put piece yourself together again I think that's the difference isn't it I think the experiences that you can reconstruct yourself from and they're ones that leave you unable to piece yourself together in any meaningful way and you know th those are often things that are to do with power weirdly you know it's often abuses of power that happen on a personal or on a state level or on a societal level so I think yeah like I try to be careful around these terminologies of positive and negative um, and try and kind of uh, have a holistic <laughs> maybe approach to them um, but I, I, yeah. Thanks, Ty. Yeah, I think that's really important to think about. Um, but I just want to ask you where, what's next for that neon hieroglyph? So in the, what are you working on with it? And yeah. where can we see it as a kind of closing question for us tonight? So, so there's been, um, like there was, um, I feel bad that I didn't prepare, but maybe I can, uh, let me see. Maybe I've got. I'm gonna give me one second, and I'll see if I can open something that might have prepared already <laughs> some images. Um, because it's a nine part. The um, because we saw the nine part um film series as part of the Manchester International Festival, and parts of it, I guess, are appearing in different scenarios and exhibitions. Yeah. Um, that's it so and also there's um different um 
sculptures and installations oh, yeah mm -hmm. that's what I'm trying to see if I can if I can maybe show you um if I can get access to it quickly I'll, I'll show you maybe just a couple of images to finish off on and if not um that's fine as well um I also uh, can you can you speak when you are looking for stuff on your computer? Yeah. Or should we leave you alone? Okay, cool. Not too tough. I wouldn't be able to. Um, um, we read a lot about your work of, about the neon hieroglyph, and 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 we were a little bit embarrassed to ask that question in case we didn't know some psychedelic terminology, but. <laughs> Where does that title comes from? Is that, does it have some story behind it? Yeah, um, so I think, I think it was in a science fiction, I think it might even be a William Gibson book, I'm ashamed to say. Um, but in it, like he talks about um, the breakdown of reality and says like there were oral neon hieroglyphs or something like that. And there was something about that image that I read, I read when I was really young that book and it really stayed with me and it also like I remember seeing them like you know having read it and then seeing them seeing that kind of or recognizing that so I want and and also like that kind of idea of language that becomes um unintel unintelligible in a way or or you know that is like mysterious I thought was right for this okay I found some things I'll see if I can share I can. Okay. So I made this um, water fountain kind of ghost. Oh, wow. That was also part of this. Um, it had all these like charms and a, gl a glass intestine. That's it at night. <laughs> So that was also uh, part of it as well. And there's also sorry, I don't know if I can find these, but there was a, a, a series of um, here we go. So these these um, objects were also part of um, the neon hieroglyph. They're kind of a lot of the sculpture in this is to do with um, crypts and burial, you know, because they're kind of overarching ideas like building a mausoleum for psychedelic witches. Like that's kind of the holding pattern of it. Um, so a lot of the objects are like kind of death, crypt related. Um, here you've got the um, rye coming out of the witch's mouth with the little lights on it. So yeah, that's, Amazing. that was part of it as well. And um, this too... So this was like an ergot pool. That... Can you see the yeah. ergot growing on that line? The witch with fried egg uh, warts. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for showing us those. Really, really, really Pleasure. cool to see. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, so, so um, where, where can we see, see them? Uh, um, okay, so what's next? Um, we did a live version as well of the film with a live score and live narration, which was really great. Like it was maybe the best thing I've ever done. And there's going to be a show in Seoul, which is quite far away, I guess, but of like a lot of objects that are related to it. And there's a book coming out um, in June um that's published by strange attractor and distributed by mit press that has um like nine illustrations and the poems and also a piece by that casper heinemann wrote that um is kind of a mixture of like 
psychedelic, uh, I guess, thinking and, and, and more theoretical bits. And Amy Hale's written a piece for it as well. Um, and there's a record that comes with that. So it's like a really beautiful object, that one, and that's coming out in June. Um, I've gone blank. Uh, there's a hand that was going to be in London. There's a group show about monuments that I'm doing like a weird hand monument that will be in that. Um, yeah, that's kind of it for now. Oh, cool. Happiness. Yeah, I won't go to Seoul, but I'll no. buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> I'll definitely get the book. So yeah, the book can... is more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, get a book. Wonderful. So I think I think we can, if you're all right with that, we can just wrap up our conversation. And and uh, I just want to thank everyone who's been watching today on Zoom and on YouTube and to Les for hosting this series yes. of conversations. And finally, big thanks to you, Tai, for being here today with us and sharing your thoughts and your work and for taking us for such an amazing socialist and feminist trip. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. Thank it's you. a real pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Bye. Bye.